Ravi, Swarnali, and Jayati also for joining in. Thank you. Um, I just thought that I'll uh, sort of uh, get started by, you know, talking about uh, a couple of ideas that, uh, you know, I find very useful. Uh, and uh, some of it is uh, sort of really based on what uh, I'm reading Annie Murphy Paul's new book called The Extended Mind. That, uh, you know, she sent it to me for a review is someone I really think is fantastic. Um, some of the things that she talks about is that, you know, the brain, she draws the analogy and says that it's more like uh, it's not a fixed compartment as we very often think, uh, but it's really like a place where a number of different ideas from various people come in. And so the method of learning she talks about is more like, you know, a bird building a nest. You get a thread, you get a piece of twig, you get something else. You put all of it together and that actually can create uh, the entire learning process. So um, when you when you look at that, I mean, that uh, process is what, uh, you know, it works really well from it comes to learning from your network. So when you hang around with people, um, you know, who are experts, one of the things that we um, should be looking at is, uh, you know, what in the book is described as cognitive apprenticeship, which is to make the inner working. You know, there is another person who's written about this whole process called working out loud. So when you actually observe somebody doing something, um, that process should make the internal thought process accessible to the novice. So that's one of the finest ways to uh, work. The other is to actually, um, ironically, copy some of the people. And I completely relate to this because when I started drawing, I um, you know, I just found that it was infinitely easy for me to first learn drawing formally. I never went to a drawing school to learn by copying, you know, well-known uh, cartoonists like uh, Lakshman at that point of time. Subsequently, um, um, you know, Ajit Nayan I became a big fan of or Mario Miranda's illustrations, not so much of his cartoons, but illustrations. They just really helped me get, uh, you know, the basics of proportion, perspective, all of that. And then once you have that done, then it's much easier to, um, you know, start building your own particular style. So that is what I found to be um, really useful. So and just I'm going to pause with that and uh, invite the rest of you to, you know, share your views. What do you think? Does it make sense to you? So Abhijit, absolutely. I when you uh, kind of put out this title, I did Google, uh, you know, um, Annie Murphy and. Um, it's fascinating, right? Because she talks about how the brain itself is wired to learn in spaces. It's it, to learn from your body, to learn from, you know, the actions of others. And uh, again, from a behavioral science perspective, right, could not agree more. Um, so there's this beautiful book that talks about how you learn, how your body is wired for learning. And one of the most best examples is the one you brought up, which is copying. Right. So the brain itself is wired to kind of it has mirror neurons and it's it's kind of fundamental in learning. It's how little kids learn to uh, smile, to kind of reach out for help and all of these things. Right. By observing the actions of others and imagine the beauty of the brain that it is wired that when I observe my parent making that action, the same areas light up in my brain irrespective of whether I'm performing that action or not, right? So it's in, in it, it's basically setting me up to learn, right? To kind of commit those actions to memory. So it's, it's a beautiful, beautiful uh, mechanism, right? And we would be doing it disservice. Like you said, people think of learning and people think of learning as a very, uh, what do you call it? Passive thing, right? Like learners are recipients. And I think that the biggest problem with learning is to think of it as passive. Learning happens when, you know, the learners themselves are actively facilitating, right? So moving around with the environment, uh, you know, work, basically doing things is how you learn. And therefore, it stands to reason everything you just said about you know, the group, the company that you keep and the kind of thoughts you're exposed to, the kind of actions are, that people are taking around you, right, is so important. But that's my start for this. Abhijit. Yeah, Ashri, what do you? Uh, I think I am very interested um, in, in the thing how your network shapes your perceptions and the kind of ramifications that that perception has about yourself and how you see the world um, 
like even in one of the projects that we did early on uh, divya and rag might remember um uh so how the peers influence and their uh defi- definition of joy uh kind of uh, triggered an individual to let's say go and uh, check out a brothel right otherwise you might seem uncool and it is those kind of perceptions um i am also very curious on uh, how it it uh, one of the things that i personally i was discussing with someone was um in the way that uh, your your guy friends or your girl friends their body language and 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 what the, how they respond to you how they reciprocate to you has influenced a perception of who ca- who is a tomboy and what are the girly things to do and and that perception has been carried on in that individual for decades together and it builds a certain kind of world view in them and and this learning is actually very very non conscious it's it's not you're not uh, you are actively learning through that experience but then i think the way it is connecting the dots for you in the head and how it how you are remembering that experience is a very non conscious um settling Uh, uh anurag what is your take on this i mean what do you think <laughs> so it's surprising that <clears throat> i had not noticed this book but it's not released yet right so no it got like yeah, a yeah yeah, yeah 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 so she wanted me to review it so i, I was lucky to get that but yeah the her is newsletter there? is fantastic if you get a chance to uh, subscribe yep. do take on it. it in fact you know uh, back in 2009 10 i think one of my favorite books ever in cognitive science is the book that talks about how the body has a mind of its own right and you know and it's an amazing book right uh, vijay like i mean there is so much experiment available now and so much evidence available that how your motor performance and your iq is so linked right and you know if 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 you are if your motor function is constrained your brain growth will be constant right and the same holds true for social also right that if you are not social your brain growth will be constant because ultimately right it, it's all about what helps your brain form new connections right new synapses and this whole idea of anticipation idea of difficulty idea of motor function idea of people to people you know reciprocities and so on and so forth all of these things in you know larger and larger in terms of the number of synapses it forms right so not surprising at all and it's so beautiful that somebody has written a book around it and i think it's already being reviewed very very favorably uh, even though it's not released right so i'm much looking forward to kind of reading this uh, but also now since you already have a sneak peek into it so tell us a little bit more about what other things she's talking about in this book so uh, you know she uh, actually talks about a couple of uh, things about uh, you know three broad aspects about the way our environment uh, the physical space makes a difference uh, you know how our body makes a difference to you you refer to that uh, you know just now rag uh, and also she you know some of it um, uh, manohar kabir actually makes another interesting point that bias is predicted prejudices and our notions uh, they travel through the network i mean uh, the other piece that annie talks about in the book is uh, you know three kinds of uh, uh, you know impact of our relation three kinds of relationships um, the experts that you hang around with that you have access to and which is why i thought that you know something like menza is actually making that available that uh, you know you're making a number of people uh it's so a two kinds that she says that experts peers and other groups or communities whichever way you want to look at it i prefer to use the word community but she likes the word group so so be it so uh, becoming like a cognitive apprentice uh, and uh, i just found that fascinating so you know demonstration then explaining it out loud i mean that's the first stage that you know you need to do that second is you structure an opportunity for the apprentice to try it out uh the third is to actually uh, sort of step back the expert steps back uh, the guidance drops as the learners become more and more proficient and then you still have a coach which is uh, the help the learner uh, needs as they go through difficulties along the way so um, you know these four stages actually i thought were um, if you make it uh, make the internal thought process accessible to novices and experts 
Uh, it's a very powerful learning process. One other piece which got my attention, I'll just take a minute on that, is deliberate imitation. You know that you, uh, uh, <laughs> when you look at um, uh, imitating experts, like you, you learn, you just buy whatever Warren Buffett buys, they study and see that you on an average land up making 10% more than, you know, the most experienced people otherwise. So if you imitate the best. So a lot of sports actually uses some of this. So that's another great. Uh, yeah, so the, one of the famous quotes on imitation is that you don't learn to imitate, you imitate to learn, right? And so, you know, imitation is one of the best form of learning, right? And we at times kind of undervalue how kids imitate us, right? How, you know, interns imitate, uh, imitate their bosses, right? And in the process, they're learning. They're not just imitating for the sake of imitating, right? But, but I also find your, you know, uh, your uh, thought from the book around uh, this whole idea of cognitive apprenticeship, right? And I think it's, it's, it's so fascinating, right, that when experts are talking to explorers, right? It should not be just about the outcome, which is the advice, right? It's also a revelation of the process that the expert is using to come to those conclusions because in the process is the learning, right? Otherwise, it, it's such a wasted opportunity that you were with an expert and you just came back with an advice and you never learned how he got to that advice, right? Is that the idea of that principle of cognitive apprenticeship? Yeah, I, and, and you know, actually, if you look at it, I mean, so many organizations, they try and create, um, you know, these mentorship programs. But the reason why it doesn't work is, uh, you know, when you actually have a mentor, uh, the the person who's getting mentored needs to understand what are the kind of choices with mm -hmm. which you sort of worked. So mentorship is a, actually a skill. I mean, it just needs to be taught to a number of people so that they know how to deconstruct their learning, which is the point that, uh, um, you know, Annie makes that, uh, for example, think about the way the medical students learn. You know, they, they are actually looking at the theory. Then they actually get down to doing something, you know, so they are uh, doing the dissection. They are actually doing the rounds. They are watching the way the person engages. And uh, my reaction was that, you know, a lot of us, we pick up our uh, social roles. Uh, you know, what does a boss behave like? You know, what mm -hmm. does a you know team member mm -hmm. behave like? What is OK? A lot of it depends on your first learnings from uh, uh, early learnings from the way that you've experienced authority or when you joined work for the very first time. How did you see the boss behaving? I mean, those are some of the very sharp ways in which our uh, mental models get created. So. I just thought that was really fantastic. Um, um, yeah, so okay. one That's one other good. idea I really liked uh, what she suggested was um, that, you know, you invite the peers to audit your own processes. You know, so if you have a peer, uh, let them come in and see what you are doing. And when you do something like that, it just allows people to, you know, um, um, improve their own processes effortlessly. So I just thought that was another brilliant uh, idea that, you know, or to copy processes from other industries which have a similar focus. I mean, so, you know, if you look at uh, the medical or healthcare industries, by copying, let's say, the airlines, you know, which is also equally safety focused, um, one of the practices which Atul Gaiton uh, Gawande Atul talks Gawande. about. It. Yeah, so he talks about checklists. So mm -hmm. I just thought it was a brilliant way to... Mm -hmm. I just have uh, two two points to make on um, on these kind of social learning uh, spaces. As an educator, um, I'm you know you're also trained to look at the power dynamics. Now, in a Mensa platform, for example, uh, we are all tagged as who's an explorer, who's an expert, and who's an experienced. But in a very conversational, open, live, uh, social area that we have to define that for ourselves. And most of the times, uh, be it, a, be it a, even though there's a defined mentor and then there are all these mentees, the dynamics changes uh, because the mentor will not know all the topic, um, uh, the, the, the extensive you know, the topic that the mentee would know, right? So the dynamic changes and at that point, the mentor is the learner and then the mentee is the one who's giving information. But um, if you if we look at any kind of, you know, peer conversations, uh, live conversations, this kind of power dynamic awareness is is less. Um, and also, uh, and, and also there is this, 
what do i say a, a, a fear for competition or fear anxiety there are these all these other emotional and biases that play uh, in that learning not uh, not achieving its purpose because of this uh, lack of ability to position orient themselves in the learner spectrum um that's the, that's one and then the, the interesting point you made uh, abhijit on this peer learning and here as well uh, most of the times especially as societies we are pressed for competition and achievement and showing what you can do that uh, often asking a peer <laughs> is looked at as oh i am uh, i am asking that person i am not able to come up with myself and it this is this not always the case but it does happen so with nowadays the buzzwords of collaboration and co-creation i think that kind of peer learning is more um, encouraged and competition is slightly getting broken down so yeah, we... I... no no the way please no i just wanted to i think one of the most important pre- and necessary and sufficient condition not sufficient but necessary conditions for learning is motivation right shri and the motivation to learn and you talked about kind of orienting a learner in the spectrum right uh, i think that motivation angle is so important when it comes to learning and uh, I'll, i'll take an example right of what i'm trying to say and the motivation can come from very different places it doesn't have to necessarily be outcome based right so uh you know f- I, I, let's let's take final mile as a company right the previous company that i was in so over there everybody who so basically everyone coming out of final mile is a type right so they identify <laughs> themselves as a certain they they fit a mold of let's say exploratory kind of growth oriented learning oriented right now uh so a one of the ways that could have been possible is that we only hire those but equally right i think what is uh, important is to recognize that that environment that final mile or a culture that a company or that company created right also nurtures this right so people who get in want to be consistent to the uh the mental models of who final mile employees are right they're looking at everybody around them citing papers and reading this book and what a cooler conversations are about you know i read this fascinating thing you have uh, things in the company that are also oriented towards sharing knowledge right now when that happens uh again wanting to be consistent to where you are and the environment you are could equally play a motivating role in learning right so i think that uh you know again another example for the peer group and the company that you keep could itself be the motivating factor rather than trying to find out something right in quotes uh but that's another way to orient learners right rather than look at them as very passive i uh, you know when i worked in advertising one of the conscious strategies uh, uh we used in advertising to attract people was uh, you know when if you uh we found that uh, a place which employs top talent of the profession automatically you know uh, the others hover around it because people are naturally curious and so the, imagine you are running a cricket academy and you've got the best of ipl players there i mean ipl i'm just taking as an example whichever profession the top players and that itself actually builds the culture number 2 i think uh the water cooler conversations are a far better indicator of the actual uh, practiced uh, culture of the place rather than whatever is put on the posters of an organization so i think the ability to um, uh, choose the organization where somebody of your type in your journey in your career thrives and i so totally agree with devya that you know i joined iishare which was um you know a certain kind of an organization where a number of uh, people would encourage and mentor you and do all that and there was a point of time when i was teaching in a particular college when i could immediately look at those people in the class and say that i i have a feeling that these three will get hired by iishare and 99% of the times that used to be true um Uh, Ajayati had a question. What is cognitive apprentice? It's the process of making the internal process of decision making available to the learner. So that process through demonstrating or creating scaffolds or fading out and coaching, which we talked about, and I'll create a you know sketch note and share it, so you will have this uh, available to you. It's just not the behavior, right? It's also how I think about the decision, right? How do I come to that decision, right? Many times the behavior is very evident that. 
he behaved like this in that situation right but how did he arrive at that decision right if that can be revealed that's when the brain of the intern grows right along with that of the manager some to say right so that's all right abhijit yeah yeah absolutely i mean you, you know being able to deconstruct uh, because uh, sometimes you know which is one of the reasons why the top player of a particular sport may or may not be the best coach because you need somebody who can actually deconstruct and some of the topmost players are actually uh, not great coaches because they have it in their muscle memory so you will find that even uh, and that's my experience that when i you know used to not understand something that was taught in class um i would uh, very often ask uh, you know <clears throat> the best people who coached me were my peers who were one step ahead of me so i think uh, uh, you know a place like mensa creates those possibilities where of course you have um, uh, you know somebody who can be miles ahead of you but i think greatest learning happens when somebody is one step ahead and says okay here is how you take the next step if you share them too much ahead this all this of uh, learning from peers and cognitive apprenticeship actually the opening up the process that that you follow to uh, to the outcome to agree, to come to the outcome that you have come to is kind of against a certain kind of culture that at least i am used to uh, um growing up which is uh, trade secrets don't uh, share hmm. how you did things and don't share your process and as a solopreneur right now i have noticed i have kept myself open for conversations and I, most of them who approach me say this that elsewhere people don't deconstruct this process to me and and you know i find it difficult uh, i find it difficult to make people communicate to me as to how to do this or how to do that how to achieve this outcome uh, but it's good to have this open conversation and and, and from what the way you defined a uh, cognitive apprenticeship I, i'm just realizing maybe as a culture also it, 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 they have to be nudged towards this approach uh, because somewhere a sense of i need to protect my approach because it's unique uh, attitude is there i i think you know um, when i draw these uh, uh, sketch notes you know i i share it freely and say it's in creative commons so feel free to use it wherever you want and a lot of people say that you could be making money selling these and i i say that look when i uh, give this out freely uh, uh, you know it forces me to think of new ways to express this so it continuously puts me in that spot that i can't reuse something so even when i uh, you know i'm sometimes i go back to revise my uh, articles which i've written before and on my website i try and reillustrate them with something completely different this time and uh, i find that it forces me to not you know take the old stuff and put it there and now it helps me improve and sometimes clearly when i look at my older stuff i wonder why people liked it at all is really bad so Uh, you know it it just the moment you give it away it just f- improves your own game so uh, true, maybe if true. if what is the one thing that you took away from this conversation we share that it's just anyone um, I, yeah. one thing no so uh, it reminds me of that old book of hp also which is on how people leave managers and not companies right it seems like the landscape has changed a little bit and it's a little more lateral and peer and not just manager protege kind of relationships right so that's interesting to think about organization that way right uh, i don't remember the name of the book abhijit but you would probably the the iconic hp book on why people leave managers and not companies something yeah. of that sort. Uh, thanks perfect thanks divya anything that Yeah but it so I I really like how the the thing of cognitive apprenticeship for me brought up this whole theory of constructivist learning right which is about how uh, learners are doers and they have to be doers and not looked at as uh, you know just just objects i think that's my big one i mean everything i want to do i want to now think of how you engage learners hey thanks uh, shri uh, just two things one is the power of imitation uh learning from imit- by imitating and uh, two is just the concept of opening up your process and the value it creates for self and others all right thanks thanks a lot i mean yeah for me you know the cognitive apprenticeship and the being a fast follower uh, those were the concepts i took away thanks thanks a lot thank you thank mate. you everyone bye bye